Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Um, happy Easter as we enter into this sacrifice of the Mass. We also, we just, on this day, on this morning, we stop and just praise the Lord for the fact that, you know, we walked with the Lord um, in his, at the Last Supper, we walked with the Lord through his journey through Gethsemane, through the way of the cross, to the cross, to death, through Holy Saturday yesterday, and now to the resurrection. And that's one of the reasons why we know we know that death is not the end because of this day, because of Easter Sunday. We know that our sufferings are, are not senseless because of Easter Sunday. Because Jesus Christ has conquered death, we know that death is not the end and our sins even are not the end of us because God's mercy is new every single morning. So as we enter into this Mass on this Easter morning, we call upon God's mercy. That is new every morning and that is yours and mine the moment we want to ask for it. We pray, Lord Jesus, you came to call sinners. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to seek and to save the lost. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You live to intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. O God, who on this day, through your only begotten Son, have conquered death and have unlocked the path to eternity, grant, we pray, that we who keep the solemnity of the Lord's resurrection may, through the renewal brought by your Spirit, rise up in the light of life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we hear from God's Word. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter proceeded to speak and said, You know what has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible, not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. Brothers and sisters, if then you are raised with Christ, seek what is above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, think of what is above, not of what is on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, your life, appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning, while it was still dark, and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they placed him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture, that he had to rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I you have a seat. So I've come to this conclusion that I am currently at an age where um, I get happy when things get canceled. Like it's one of those situations where it's, it's like, and it, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if when this kicked in, it might've been, been for a long time, might've been a long time coming, but one of those situations where, like I remember as a kid, like as a kid when things got canceled, it was like, you're, you're just like devastated by this. But as I keep getting older and older, the more things, I mean, even things, obviously things that are burdens, if they get canceled, it's like, whew, good, relief. Um, but there's sometimes where it's like, I don't know if you've experienced this, but it's like, even things I like, like even good things, if they get canceled, like good, great, that is awesome. It's so nuts that even things that I enjoy, um, I get relieved when they're canceled. And I think the reason, obviously, because stuff takes energy, right? <laughs> I feel tired all the time. I think some one of the reasons why, why as I'm getting older, maybe as we get older, when things get canceled, we get relieved is uh, because our lives are too full. Like in so many ways, that, that can be the... Uh, just kind of the reality. Or another thing, our hearts could be too small. Because again, I go back to like, what, what have you had this situation where something got canceled and it was like devastating to you? I remember uh, a couple years ago, I have a, my oldest niece was getting married. And so all of us were going down to North Carolina to get to this wedding. And it was so, we were so excited, looking forward to this. And then one of my siblings, one of their kids got COVID. And so that whole family couldn't go. And they, I mean, they, this is maybe three years ago or so, two years ago, I'm not sure. But they bring it up regularly that, oh, so-and-so is the one who made it so we couldn't go because they were looking so forward to this. Sometimes things have our heart to such a degree that when they're canceled, it's not a relief. When they're canceled, it's, it's not even just kind of like, a, oh, that's a bummer. When they're canceled, it's devastating. Speaking of COVID, I guess, you know, this is the, it's four years since the Easter where we all had to do this online. It's been four, four years ago that, that um, you know, the bishops in many dioceses around the country, around the world, had decided that in order to stop the spread, in order to protect whatever, uh, that we had to stay home. And, and mass, mass was canceled. And I, I know that for a lot of people, um, when mass was canceled, the question we have to ask here is just you ask yourself, when mass was canceled, what happened to your heart? I know some people were angry. I know some people really disturbed, like, why could, how could you possibly cancel mass? I know some people, uh, they, they said they, they, long, they deeply longed for the Eucharist even more. And some people were, were deeply grieved. But I, I, the truth is, I think that some of us were relieved. I, just let's be honest about this. I, I think at, at some level, like, oh, I don't have to go to Mass. I, I have the, this obligation, this duty. Even maybe, even though it's a good thing that I do, may, again, maybe your experience of Mass is like it's a burden. Just the, have to, the, the obligation I have every single week, I have to do this. Or maybe your experience of Mass is that, no, 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 Mass is a good thing. But if it's canceled, it's kind of a relief. And I think it's, it's worth right now on this, on this Easter Sunday to say, okay, four years ago, we weren't able to go to Mass. We weren't able to receive Holy Communion. We weren't able to receive the Eucharist. What's the difference between those people who are grieved at Mass being canceled and those of us who were relieved when Mass was canceled? Again, it could be the same, same as everything else. Our lives are overfull. It could be just that, that we have a lot of good things going on in our lives and, and God, you know, Jesus, the Mass, the Eucharist, is just another good thing. That that. That could be the fact. It could be the reality that for many of us, the Eucharist 
isn't necessary. It's just an accessory. Like, again, let's, let's, it could be that for many of us, Jesus isn't a necessity. He's an option. That, you know, he's really good. It's really good to have him. But, I mean, if I really look at my life and the way I've created a life, Jesus is an accessory. That the Mass, the Eucharist, that it's more an accessory than it is necessary. And that just could be the truth. Again, it's, it's, it's worth pausing and saying, okay, God, reveal my heart to me. Because I, I really think, I think when something gets canceled, it reveals our hearts. If my experience is this is a relief, that reveals something. It reveals that maybe this was a burden and maybe it was a good thing, but it reveals that this wasn't a necessity for me. If, if, if Mass is canceled and I can't go, if I'm unable to get to the Eucharist, if I'm unable to receive Jesus, and unable to worship God the way he's asked me to worship him, and I'm relieved, maybe it just reveals that, uh, yeah, God is good, but he's kind of a relative good, right? He's, Jesus is important, but he's of relative importance. That, that the Eucharist, yeah, very, very valu valuable, but valuable as an accessory. You know, I, I think um, maybe this has to do, again, with our own version of God. Uh, that God, again, super important, but he's kind of like, like the second kidney. I mean, he's good, good to have, but you don't really need that second kidney. You can actually function without. Like the Eucharist is like that second kidney. It's like, no, 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 it's really nice. It's, I really value that. It's good to have, but I don't need it for my life. And I think that Easter Sunday reminds us of how do we see Jesus? Like, how, how do we actually see God? Because again, if a lot of us say, no, no, Jesus, very, very important. But is this resurrection of Jesus true? Like, is, is Catholicism true? Is Christianity true? C.S. Lewis, he had wrote about this years ago, and he, he said this, he said, we need to understand this. Christianity, if it's false, is of no importance. And if it's true, it is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Like the only thing Jesus can't be is one good among many goods. Again, if the resurrection is false, if the resurrection didn't actually happen, then he's not even moderately important. He is of no importance. If the resurrection did happen, then Jesus is of infinite importance and worship of him is of infinite importance. And this is one of those kind of things we can ask ourselves about this. Like, you know, because a lot of us have experienced um, pain in the church, maybe even experienced difficulty in following after Jesus. But here's the thing. If the resurrection of Jesus is false, then the good examples of Christians around us is worthless. That's no reason to be Christian. If the resurrection of Jesus is false, then having good community is no reason to be Christian. If, if, if the resurrection of Jesus didn't actually happen, then no matter how easy it is to follow Jesus, you shouldn't follow Jesus. On the other hand, if the resurrection of Jesus is actually an historical fact and it actually did happen, then the bad example of Christians is no reason to not be a Christian. That if Jesus truly conquered death and rose from the dead, then even horrible actions, evil actions of Christian leaders is no reason to not be a Christian. And if Jesus actually truly rose from the dead, if this day, the, the, the fact that we celebrate on this day and commemorate on this day, if this is true, that Jesus rose from the dead, then no matter how hard or high his call is, that's the call for you, right? Jesus said what? He said, if you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. If he rose from the dead, then that's what we're called to do. Even the hard teachings, even the burden sometimes of going to Mass. Again, let's ask the question for myself, is Mass essential or is it optional? Is Mass necessary or is it an accessory? So, all Lent, we followed this guy named Father Walter Chizek. This is the last time I'm going to reference Father Walter for at least three weeks. Um, but, but there's a chapter, and I, if you got the book, I invite you to read this chapter. It's a book on the mystery or the meaning of the Mass. And in it, Father Walter talks about his relationship with the Eucharist, but not only his relationship with the Eucharist. The, let me go on. So he said that celebrating Mass every day was the most important thing he could possibly do. That it was the number one thing. That here he is in Russia trying to serve. Here he is in Russia uh, arrested. Here he is in Russia in a slave labor camp 
Here he's in Russia in obscurity being tortured and he said, but, the, but the, the number one thing, my preoccupation of every single, my obsession of every single day was I needed to be able to say the mass. And so there, there were things that he did. He said it was so painful in solitary confinement, it was the first time he ever had gone that long without the mass, five years. In fact, he could hear the bells of the one place in Moscow that you actually could say mass, but he couldn't, he didn't have access, he's in solitary confinement. So what he would do is he would actually just recite the prayers of the mass, knowing that he couldn't actually have Jesus in the Eucharist with him, but he would try to get close to Jesus by just simply praying those prayers that he had memorized alone by himself in that solitary confinement. When he finally got to the slave labor camp, it just blows my mind. He finally gets to the gulag in Siberia, right north of the Arctic Circle. And that's when he said, my preoccupation every single day, my obsession, my, the, the passion was I needed to be able to say mass every single day. And there were days when, you know, back in, before 1964, you had, didn't just have a one hour Eucharistic fast, you'd have to fast from the night before. And so he wouldn't eat, and again, they're, they're feeding them these tiny, minuscule rations. So Father Walter would fast from the night before, and if he could say mass and the next morning, great. But if he couldn't say it until noon, he would fast to noon. And you say, well, of course he did. He's, he's a priest. You know, it's very important for him. Father Walter said that he was surrounded by these Catholics in a Soviet gulag, in a slave labor camp, who would regularly, would do anything they could to be able to receive the Eucharist every day, not just on Sundays. They would do everything they could to be able to receive the Eucharist every single day, even if that meant fasting from the night before all through that day. If they could, have mass, they could have mass at noon, they would fast all the way through noon. They work all morning on an empty stomach. Now think of how quickly we are to like kind of dismiss the Eucharistic fast or even just how quickly we are to say, well, you know, it's snowing outside. I can't really get to church. These men didn't give themselves a pass. These men lived day to day knowing that the next day could be their last day. But he said regularly, this is the thing that just blew my mind. I, I, I'm thinking like fasting from the night before to the next morning, that's one thing. All the way to noon, that's another thing. But Father Walter said there are many days when we weren't able to say Mass until the end of the workday. They would come back to the labor camps and whatever rations they were given were stuck in their pockets and they didn't even touch them so that they could receive Jesus Christ in the Eucharist at the end of the day, still holding on to that fast. For those men in that gulag in that slave labor camp, not just for the priest, but for ordinary Catholics. The Eucharist was not an accessory. The Eucharist was necessary. It was not optional. Jesus in the Eucharist was absolutely essential. And that remains the question for us. If the resurrection of Jesus is true, and he truly did say, take this, all of you, and eat of it. Take this, all of you, and drink of it. This is my body, do this, and this is my blood, do this in memory of me. And this is how he wants us to worship him. This is, that, means, that means this is essential. But the question remains, is it essential for you and for me, or is it simply optional? Is it necessary, or is it an accessory? How do, how do you, this is the last thing, how do you and I get to the place where the Eucharist is, is not optional, that Eucharist is necessary. Well, I think one thing is, again, it could be true that our lives are overfull. Again, our, it could just be that, the fact, our lives are overfull. We have so many good things in our lives that there's no room for the ultimate thing. And maybe that's the case. Maybe that this case on this, this Sunday, of Easter Sunday, right, this Resurrection Sunday, that I know during Lent, we, we prune our lives, right? we purify our lives, try to get close to the Lord. We say, what do I need to say no to? It could be the case that during the season of Easter, your invitation and my invitation is to look at how full your life is with good things, so much so that it's pushed to the outside, pushed to the fringe, pushed to the sidelines, the ultimate thing. Does my room, does my life have any room for Jesus at the center of it? Does my life has any, have any room for the Eucharist? If the Eucharist was actually necessary, if the Eucharist was essential and not merely optional, not merely an accessory, would there be any room or do I need to make more room? What do I do with my heart? Like sometimes we feel like we can't control our hearts, right? Just like hearts want what the heart wants. Um, and we realize that what we love, we spend our time on. That's just true. That's just be able to look at ourselves and think like what, what we love is what we dream about in our free time. What we love is what we think about in off times. What we love is what we you know, pre are preoccupied with. What we love, we spend our time on. I believe that's true. 
But I also believe that what we spend our time on, we end up loving. The invitation would be this. Not only is my life overcrowded, is my life overfull, am I so full of good things that the ultimate thing doesn't have any space, but the next is to say, can I actually make a sacrifice to spend time with Jesus in the Mass? So what I mean by that is this Easter season, can I not just go to Mass on Sundays? Can I actually go to Mass during the week? Just for this Easter season. To be able to actually make the commitment to say, okay, I go on Sunday and I also go Tuesday and Thursday. Or I go on Sunday and I also go on Wednesday and Friday. Whatever that is. But to be able to, be able to say, I go on Sunday and two other days of the, of the week. Two other weekdays. To be able to, to embrace that, not just because it's something I have to do. Not to be a burden. Not to be just another good thing. But to recognize that if, for me, the Eucharist isn't necessary. If, for me, the Eucharist isn't essential, then maybe what I need to do is I need to make the Eucharist essential. What I need to do is maybe I need to make the Eucharist necessary. What I might need to do is I might need to rearrange my life in such a way, in a dramatic way over the course of this Easter season, so that if there's any trace in my heart that the Eucharist is an accessory, that's gone. If there's any trace in my heart that the Eucharist is optional, then I've done away with that. You've killed that because you've made room in an overfull life. And then you've made time for the Lord Jesus and worship of him in the Mass. What we love, we spend our time on. But what we spend our time on, we grow to love more and more. And that's the invitation, that's the challenge today. Here's the thing. If this day isn't true, if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, don't do this. He is of no importance. The Eucharist is of no importance. It's not true. It's not real. The Mass doesn't do anything. But if Jesus really conquered death, if Jesus really rose from the dead, then this is of infinite importance and it is worth your very life. It's worth your very life and my very life. It's worth your eternity and my eternity to let him be essential to let the Eucharist be necessary and to stop, stop, stop treating Jesus, treating the Mass, treating the Eucharist as an accessory. On this Sunday, we have the opportunity. Uh, last night, we had a number of people come into the Catholic Church uh, from all over the world, all over the, all over the country, and they stood up and they were asked questions about whether they were willing to be baptized, and they were baptized. But they, asked, they were asked if they believed in Jesus, if they rejected sin and Satan, and they said, I do. This is your opportunity, my opportunity today, to be able to Make those same baptismal promises, to renew your baptismal promises. Whenever you are baptized, at some point, someone answered, probably they answered for you. This is our chance on this Easter Sunday to answer for ourselves. And so I invite you to stand and renew your baptismal promises. The answer, the response is, I do if you in fact do. So I ask you all, do you renounce sin so as to live in the freedom of the children of God? I do. Do you renounce the lure of evil so that sin may have no mastery over you? I do. I do. Do you renounce Satan, the author and prince of sin? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose again from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? I do. The Almighty God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and bestowed us forgiveness for our sins, keep us by his grace in Christ Jesus our Lord for eternal life. Amen. Amen. Now I invite you to come. Uh, now we present our prayers before our Heavenly Father.
that the church may boldly and faithfully proclaim the resurrection of Christ to those who do not yet believe in it. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. That the leaders of the church may embody the mysteries of new life which we celebrate in our liturgy. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. That the leaders of our nations and world may give priority to those with greatest need in the distribution of the world's basic resources. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. That in the light of Christ's victory over death, nations may work together to overcome violence against all, especially the poor, the weak, and the unborn. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the newly baptized and confirmed, and those received into full communion with the Catholic Church, may continue to grow with their parish communities in worship and in service. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have died may one day share in the promise of new love for us by the resurrection. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, we know that you hear all of our prayers. We ask you to answer these through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our redemption of all his holy church. Exultant with paschal gladness, O Lord, we offer the sacrifice by which your church is wondrously reborn and nourished. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But on this day, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true Lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying, he has destroyed our death, and by rising, restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition that through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to guard, grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Daniel, our Bishop, and all those who holding to the truth hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants for whom we now pray. And all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you, 
For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and for all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Celebrating the most sacred day, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, we continue to pray. Therefore, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands and with eyes raised to heaven. To you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, O oh Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them, as once you were pleased to accept the gift of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father, in the faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us, who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with a sign of faith, and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, in all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, and Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us.
through him, and with him and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Through the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Let us pray. Look upon your church, O God, with unfailing love and failure and favor, so that renewed by the Paschal mysteries, she may come to the glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, once a uh, couple quick announcements. One is Happy Easter uh, today. Um, also, that reminder: uh, you might be, you know this this mass is offered for all those who you know aren't able to make it. So that even that even that invitation of like, hey, go to mass more than more than just Sunday. You might say that's impossible for me. Um, the Lord knows that. He knows you. He knows your heart. One powerful way. We'll talk about this next weekend. Next weekend is Divine Mercy Sunday. One powerful way for you. Again, if you're homebound, if you're shut in, you can't get to mass physically can't be there, but you want to participate in, in the offering up of the sacrifice of the Son to the Father for the salvation of the world, for the glory of the Father, it's a prayer called the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. We'll, we'll talk about it more next Sunday. But if you're like, oh, I'm so frustrated because I not only am stuck here, but then also the priest is like telling me to go to Mass two more times each week. That's a real invitation for all those who can. But if you can't, know that you can participate in in the offering up the sacrifice of the Son to the Father. You can participate in the Mass by praying this thing called the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. Again, we'll talk more about that next weekend. But just so you know, um, all is not lost. <laughs> there is always hope and there's always something we can do. Right now, we can pray. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all of evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. I invite you to bow down for the blessing. There's going to be four big amens. May Almighty God bless you through today's Easter solemnity and in his compassion defend you from every assault of sin. Amen. And may he who restores you to eternal life in the resurrection of his only begotten endow you with the prize of immortality. Amen. Now that the days of our Lord's Passion have drawn to a close, may you who celebrate the gladness of the Paschal Feast come to Christ's help and exulting in coming with Christ's help and exulting in spirit to those feasts that are celebrated in eternal joy. Amen. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Praise God.